I have Stellarium set to March 1st at, at a little after 3 p.m. here in Seattle. This is what the sky would look like at the time of this recording. Um, as you can see, the moon has just peaked above the eastern horizon, and so that'll be out for quite some time. And if I click this little planet button, that will actually label the moon. And it also labels the sun and any planets that are going to be visible in the night sky. So I can go over here and see that the sun is on. What I want to do here is I kind of want to focus, for now, I want to focus on the eastern horizon because that's where all the action happens. That's where uh, all the stars and all the planets will rise. They'll come from that direction and they'll head overhead and then set in the west as the sun is on its way there now. Now, I want to see what's coming up later on tonight, so how can I do that? Well, if I turn the atmosphere, or I'll, first I'll turn the ground off here, and anything below the horizon, that's what's going to be coming up pretty soon here. So that stuff not, not, wouldn't be visible, but I don't see anything. If I turn off the cardinal points, I still don't see anything. Uh, that's because I have the atmosphere. And I just want to show you this little handy little feature here by clicking Sky and Viewing Options. Um, over here... Uh, I can I can mess around with all sorts of things. I can turn the star labels on or off. The slider, what that will do is it'll show all the dim label all the dim stars if I go that way, and only the bright stars will be labeled if I go that way with the sliders. And similarly to the planets here. Now, if I wanted to uh, label the horizon, I can do so using the markings tab. You click the horizon, and there's an artificial line that it. Uh, puts there to show you the true horizon. Equator, meridian, ecliptic, we are going to use those later. Those are nice little functions uh, in Stellarium. So now going back, I can put the ground on, and you can see that the horizon almost matches uh, where the ground meets the sky. So trees and shrubs and buildings might be in the way, but that's kind of the true horizon, and I'm kind of just showing you that as a true reference point. If I turn the atmosphere off, all of a sudden all those stars that were hidden underneath are now visible. If I turn the ground off, I can see what's coming up, and hey, Jupiter's coming up pretty soon, so that's pretty cool. I'll be able to see that tonight. I got Betelgeuse and Rigel, which are part of Orion. I got Castor and Pollux, which are the Gemini twins. And, um, whoops. Now I'm going to turn the atmosphere back on, and now those other stars aren't visible at the moment. I'm going to turn the ground back on, and over here you saw all those stars, and where did they go? Well, they are hidden because they are not as bright as the sky itself. So once they become brighter than the, than the atmosphere, I'm going to turn the horizon off because it's not really needed. Uh, once they become brighter than the atmosphere, then you actually can start to see them with your naked eye. Now I'm going to increase the time step a little bit. If you notice here that the seconds are going a lot faster than the normal second, click again, and I've got minutes going faster. So you're going to want to be a little bit careful about that uh, because uh, if you click it too fast, then you can get dizzy because it starts going really fast. So now I can actually see the motion of the objects in the sky. You can see the sun is starting to set. Uh, Basically, time is sped up here, so you can see how the moon is moving uh, relative to the night sky. So I'm going to uh, increase it just a little bit more, so I don't have to wait so long, and now it's getting a little darker, getting a little darker out, and whoa, where did Jupiter come from? If you noticed, all of a sudden Jupiter appeared in the sky. Well, that's because it became brighter than the atmosphere, and that's why you suddenly you were able to see it. Uh, other stars, like you see Procyon up there, those are some of the earliest stars you see uh, in the evening sky right after sunset, and uh, Sirius, which is the brightest star in the northern hemisphere, that's part of the constellation Canis Major, uh, that star is always really visible uh, in the night sky. Uh, Betelgeuse uh, is a big red giant, and Orion, Rigel is kind of Orion's, Orion's foot. This is everyone's favorite constellation, that's his belt, that's his shoulders, and these are his feet, and over here is his bow. That's really spectacular if you see that away from a city where there's no uh, less light pollution. You can actually see his bow pretty well. Um, but if you're in, a, then there's Aldebaran, which is in Taurus the bull, which is Orion, is hunting that bull. So one thing I want to talk about here is these options, constellation lines, constellation labels, and constellation art. These are like really handy features for getting the constellations. So if I click constellation labels, it'll label where those constellations are in the sky, which is a handy little guide. And even if you can't recognize those constellations right now, um, that is their general positions. And I'll show you in a little bit how to connect those dots. Um, for now, I kind of want to talk about uh, altitude of these objects, altitude and azimuth. 
and as well as right ascension and declination. Right ascension and declination are fixed coordinates, and altitude and, alt uh, altitude and azimuth are local coordinates. So the fixed coordinates never change. These guys, right ascension, declination, they never, ever change. They are like... So anywhere on Earth, someone can see where's the right ascension declination, they can find it. Altitude and azimuth are local. That's north, east, south, west, and that's altitude. That changes where you're, depending on your location. So right now it says that the altitude is about 58 degrees, so that's about 58 degrees above the horizon, and that kind of makes sense, because if I go up to Capella, Capella will be approaching somewhere around 90 degrees, so that'll be almost directly overhead. Um, I'm going to speed this up a little bit, because it, it, it's increasing. Eventually it'll get to near... Uh, It'll get near to 90 degrees. 90 degrees would be directly overhead. And that kind of makes sense if you if you scroll down a little bit. Uh, there's the horizon, and then way above, this is as if you're tilting your head upwards, looking directly up, you would see Capella. So you can see as the time is moving as it is down here, you can see that those altitude and azimuth uh, coordinates are always moving. So now let's, why don't we take a look at the actual constellation line. So if I click this, now I can start to see what these constellations kind of look like. These are good schematic. People connect the dots differently, but these are also actually pretty good. These are the Gemini twins. They kind of look like they're holding hands. Uh, it's Castor and Pollux. Castor is too dim to be labeled right now, apparently. Uh, those are the heads of Gemini. Uh, Canis Minor, you've got up there, which is actually just two, uh, two stars that are supposed to be a dog somehow. Uh, I'm going to just speed this up a little bit so it gets darker and kind of more fun to view. And it's about a little after 6.30 according to that clock there. And you can see that the it's starting to get darker and the moon is starting to get fuzzy um, around it. And you, people see rings around the moon. Well, that's because the atmospheric distortion, that light's getting dispersed. If you turn off the atmosphere, there is no rings around the moon. If I turn on the atmosphere, then it starts to, starts to have that effect where it looks like there's rings around the moon. That's the light getting dispersed. So here's Orion, there's Taurus, there's Auriga, which kind of looks like a home plate, which is connected to Taurus. This is a pretty prominent one once you see it. Once you see it for a couple of times, then you'll always notice it. Uh, Taurus is a little bit more difficult because Aldebaran's not necessarily on any kind of known sort of joint in the bowl, if you will. Uh, over here we've got Andromeda, and if you wanted to see Andromeda, this is something to point out here. According to the clock down at the bottom, this is approximately like 7.15, so this is just after sunset, and most of Andromeda is already below the horizon. So if you wanted to see Andromeda, you'd have to get out just after sunset. On this particular night, although a couple weeks ago this wasn't the case, you had all these three planets aligned, which would be great for your observation journal. Uh, but you could actually see Mars and Venus with your naked eye, so that would be kind of cool. But if you wanted to see those on this particular night, again, which is March 1st, you would have to get out right after sunset, and shortly thereafter, Mars is already below the horizon, and now the clock is getting almost 8 o'clock, Mars is almost almost gone already so you'd have to get out there pretty early so this is this kind of way why it's this is a good um, way to plan out your observing evening so you can see what time you need to be out and stuff so you see Andromeda over there and you say hey isn't there an Andromeda galaxy this is a nice little function I'll just show you quickly here you can click on this deep sky objects tab and there's the Andromeda galaxy because it's near Andromeda uh, you can't really see this with the naked eye um, and it's through telescopes kind of fuzzy it gives you catalog information there um, which helps with automatically programmed telescopes, and it's it's kind of cool to see through telescope, but it's really fuzzy and got to flick your eye back and forth, and uh, but it, it's cool to see another galaxy. It's the closest galaxy to us. Now the, you can see there's lots and lots of deep sky objects. A lot of those are hard to get in a telescope. I'm going to turn those off because they're kind of cluttering the screen. Now I'm going to talk about some of more another couple of famous uh, constellations. There's Cassiopeia. That's the queen. That's her crown. And there's Cephas. He's kind of got a head with a crown on it. And uh, they're the king and queen, and they follow each other around in the night sky. And there's Draco the dragon. That's a huge one. If you can make that out, you've kind of got an advantage on a lot of people because that's kind of hard to connect all those dots in, uh, in the night sky. Polaris is, uh, is the North Star. That's always fixed and never moves. And that kind of makes up that it connects to the Little Dipper, and that's the handle. And all the stars rotate around that. So Ursa Minor is going to rotate around that with the handle fixed. So you say, where's the Big Dipper? Well... The Big Dipper is actually part of a bigger constellation. This is the Great Bear, Ursa Major, and his hind quarters are kind of the Big the Big Dipper. And these are called the Pointer Stars, and they're called the Pointer Stars because you can always find Polaris because they point right at Polaris. 
So now I'm going to speed it up a little bit so you can see kind of how these constellations revolve around um, how these constellations revolve around Polaris. So I'm going to increase the time step again so it's going faster. Now I'm starting to actually see movement and just a little bit faster, shall we? And now you can kind of see how all the constellations are revolving around Polaris. And they'll do this all night and all day long. These stars that you see here, these constellations that you see here, like Cassiopeia and Cephas, notice that they never go below the horizon. That's because they're called circumpolar. That's a term that we use for, for stars and constellations. Cassiopeia and Cephas uh, in this particular location are circumpolar in that they never dip below the horizon. If you look to your left, you can see Auriga is dipping below the horizon. So these will rotate around, and if we wait a little bit, pretty soon we're going to have a sunrise here. And we have the sunrise, and suddenly you can't see those stars. So I'm going to slow it down to real time again here. And you can't really see those stars, so if I click those constellation labels off, you can see where their relative locations are. But notice that you can't really see the stars, but they are there. That just means that the atmosphere is brighter than those actual stars. If I click off the atmosphere, then they would be there. So this is a kind of a great little tool if you are going, uh, say, camping, where there's not going to be a lot of light pollution, or if you're going on a cruise, where you're going to be uh, on a boat in the ocean, where there's not a lot of light pollution, and the stars are really prevalent. You can use this software to sort of plan out your evening, like, what am I going to see? Like, I know I'm going to have a good night of, of star viewing, so I want to see what's going to come up. And you can change the time and date and look in advance to see what will be interesting options. So this is really, uh, really cool software um, for knowing what you're going to observe on a given night.